Hey everybody, and welcome back to Kerbal Space Program RP0. We are out on the launch pad again with a, another Shuriken. Uh, this is going to be uh, STS-5. This will be our fifth shuttle flight, and hopefully the first one to be entirely top to bottom successfully. Uh, we've got uh, Yegor heading up the controls with Bob and Nina. Uh, riding along. This is kind of another moneymaker to do a three-person crewed orbital. Uh, but we do have some new science experiments that we have unlocked thanks to our tech tree and our very long list of backlog technologies. So we're going to go ahead and get them off the pad. You'll notice we're not facing uh, the same way as usual. We're going to attempt a polar orbit, which would be a first for our space shuttle program. So, uh, all right, throttle set to full, SAS is on. Let's get our ignition sequence running. And they are lit, let's go. Yep. A little surge to the north, but no big deal. Maybe I should get an in-flight screeny this time. That looks way better, doesn't it? All right. So, uh, hopefully this will be just a nice, uh, uneventful easy flight into a not quite perfect polar orbit, but as long as it takes us over the poles as a biome, I think we will get uh, all of the science we need and our atmosphere analysis that we had from last time. We can well, press the right section there and run it. What? Oh, it's on the inside of the cargo bay. Apparently you can't run that experiment when it's stowed. That is an interesting revelation, and so, once again, another part that I have brought along for absolutely no reason whatsoever. Uh, I did make some minor changes to this craft since the last time it flew, namely the uh, angle of pitch on the J2s to kind of help reduce some of the fighting it was giving me last time. Um, small improvements as to the location of thrusters, but uh, that's pretty much it. Yeah, and it's still giving me this weird oscillation wiggle. Thank you, tapered wings. Now that we've passed Mach 1, it's going to struggle with me a little bit. I don't know if I want to turn on atmospheric autopilot or not. Uh, because I need to keep making tiny adjustments here all the time. Alright, so I'm going to go ahead and get these guys to orbit, and I will uh, pick all of you up there. All in all, it was a uh, very streamlined, very easy launch. The uh, vehicle has more than enough Delta V to uh, deal with getting into a polar orbit, although we did have uh, a little bit more instance of the wiggles, as you can kind of see here. But uh, no engines failed, the boosters separated clean, and uh, we were eventually able to get almost to a clear 90 degree uh, uh, inclination without much issue. And so it's getting a little hard to remember all these flights now, but I think these are actually the first crewed mission to be in a polar orbit. Hmph. <laughs> ah. Well, if we're going to keep it in orbit, we might as well just uh, go ahead and use these engines to get it there. Very stable. Oh, come on. Oh, that worked exactly the opposite of the way I wanted it to. All right, well, we're going to stage off the EFT. Uh, I should still have... Some, okay, good. I do have liquid hydrogen on board that I plan on using for the fuel cells. So let's ditch the EFT. And let that drift away from us for a bit. We are in orbit. However, we are in a 389 by uh, 18 or 385 by 189 kilometer orbit, which does not suit the contract. We can shut down these two and activate our AJ-10. So um, when we get to apoapsis, we're going to have to raise that to above 200, I believe, and then when we well, when we get to our apoapsis, we're going to have to raise our periapsis above 200. And when we get to periapsis, we're going to have to lower our apoapsis to below 350. I believe that's the stipulations of the contract. Let me just double check. Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, okay, yeah, here we go. 
below 350, above 160. So, and our eccentricity does in fact matter a bit. But in the meantime, we can start deploying all of our things. Namely, uh, we've got some additional solar panels on here to uh, help the RTGs with their load. They did not quite do a perfect job last time, although it looks like, well, let me move this out of the way. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, we're still showing a drain. Not a big deal. All right, so let's uh, go ahead and get ourselves warped around here to our uh, apoapsis, which be down just, uh, well, it'll be, wait, where's our orbit? There's our orbit. There we are. All right, let's get warped in and make our maneuver. And there's our first flyby, crude flyby of Antarctica. How cool that must be. All right, and let's get ourselves going here. We need to phase two prograde. I guess upside down doesn't quite matter. How's our uh, ignition looking? Very stable, excellent. I mean, I know technically I don't need to raise this because it's above 160, but I would like to get it uh, into a relatively circular orbit. There's our ignition. Oh, I may have offset that engine just by a bit too much, having to really lay on the thrusters to keep things stable here. Uh, 250, that sounds good. All right, we'll just uh, keep this orientation so that when we swing back around to our periapsis, we can lower our apoapsis and hopefully get this orbit nice and circularized. And we'll be uh, swinging here across the North Pole momentarily after we swing past Russia. Oh, and now connected through satellite. Look at that. Probably an unintentional satellite, I have to say. <laughs> Alright, time to periax is about a minute. It won't take nearly that long to make this burn. So we'll just speed it up just a bit. Alright, fair enough. Let's just go ahead and light that engine. Oh, vapor and feed lines. Dang it. Very stable. Light it up. There we go. And officially now below 350. Let's just see if we can't make a nice round orbit at 250 some odd. We're gonna have to expend the energy anyway, you know? But uh, we did use significantly less fuel. This one has unlimited ignitions. Yeah, I thought so. All right, we're lowering our periapsis now. So. 256 by 245. Let's just double check, make sure that satisfies our contract parameters. It does, and now they just have to stay up here for six days. So uh, we're coming across the North Pole. We should probably orient ourselves into the sun, but I want to go ahead and, and, well, yeah, we should orient ourselves into the sun. That's that's the big one right now. We need to make sure we can maintain electric power. All right. Yeah, it went from a dot two three draw to a dot three draw, just in that a uh, little bit of um, roll there. All right, let's go ahead and open our cargo bay and deploy our scientific instruments for this mission. Uh, we have this one first, the uh, irradiance scanner, which can only be used from high orbit. Of course it can only be used from high orbit. That just makes too much sense. All right, and we're going to activate both fuel cells and try to burn off as much of this uh, liquid hydrogen li and liquid oxygen that we can. But uh, this one we should be able to do. Collect soil moisture sensor data. 
I'm really hoping this will be biome specific. We are over the highlands currently. Moisture scan while spaced near Earth. Not biome specific. Only gives us nine science. No bonus for bringing it home. So we'll just transmit that off. Well, we got nine whole science. We are, however, going to get paid about uh, 480 grand for doing this. So we'll just let that little soil sensor thing spin to its little heart's content for the next six days while we just kind of hang out up here, charging the hell out of these batteries. I'm perfectly content with running that uh, liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen dry. <laughs> We don't need it. We've got an abundance of Aerozine and N2O that we're probably going to have to dump. Because we're really heavy right now. These are... Nope. Yeah, that's life support. No big deal. So... <laughs> so far, STS-5 is uh, in really good shape. And we can make it so that we definitely land during the daytime this time, which I'm super excited about, landing a shuttle during the day and maybe even on a runway. I don't want to overpromise because runways are small and hard to hit, whereas Northern Africa or deserts in general are very big and easy to hit. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, well, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Thank you so much for hanging out. I do appreciate it, and I'll see all of you in the next one. So until then, see you later.